Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Star and Lily. And tonight we're going to start The Political Ideas of St. Thomas Aquinas. And I'm not going to read the introduction. I'll save that for later. Because it does the introduction. It starts with the introduction and the note on the text. And the, we'll start the Summa, the Summa Theologica 1 through 11. Interesting because it says Summa Theologica, first part of the second part. I don't understand that part, but that's where it starts in this book. Question 90 of the essence of laws in four articles. We have now to consider the intrinsic principles of acts. Now the intrinsic principle inclining to evil is the devil of whose temptations we've spoken in the first part. I think they've kind of edited it as well. They've added it a little bit. But the intrinsic principle moving to God, to good is God, who both instructs us by his means of his law, assists us by his grace, wherefore in the first place we must speak of law, in the second place of grace concerning law. We must consider one, law itself in general, two, its parts concerning law in general. Three points offer themselves for our consideration. One, its essence, two, the different kinds of law, the effects of laws, three, the effects of laws. Under the first head, there are four points of inquiry. One, whether the law is something pertaining to reason, concerning the end of law, three, is cu its cause for the promulgation of law. First article, whether law is something pertaining to reason. We proceed thus to the first article, objection one. It would seem that law is not something pertaining to reason. But the apostle says, I see another law in my members, etc. But nothing pertaining to reason is in the members, since the reason does not make use of a bodily organ. Therefore, law is not something pertaining to reason. Further, in the reason there is nothing else but power, habit, and act. But law is not the power itself of reason in like manner. Neither is it a habit of reason, because the habits of reason are the intellectual virtues of which we have spoken above. Nor again is it an act of reason, because then law would cease. When the act of reason ceases, for instance, while we are asleep, therefore law is nothing pertaining to reason. Further, the law moves those who are subject to it to act of right, but it belongs properly to the will to move to act, as is evident from what has been said above. Therefore, law pertains not to the reason, but to the will, according to the words of the just, jurist. Whatever pleases the sovereign has the force of law. On the contrary, it belongs to the law to command and to forbid, but it belongs to reason to command as stated above. Therefore, law is something pertaining to reason. I answer that law is a rule and measure of act, whereby man is induced to act or is restrained from acting. For lex, law is derived from legari, to bind, because it binds one to act. Now the rule and measure of human acts is the reason, which is the first principle of human acts, as is evident from what has been stated above, since it belongs to the reason direct to the end, which is the first principle in all matters of action, according to the philosopher. Now that which is the principle in any gen genus is the rule and measure of that genus. For instance, unity is the genus of numbers. And the first movement in the genus of movements, consequently it follows that law is something pertaining to reason. Since law is a kind of rule and measure, it may be in something in two ways. First, as in that which measures and rules. And since that is proper to reason, it follows that, in this way, law is in the reason alone. Secondly, as in that which is measured and ruled. In this way, law is in all those things that are inclined to something by reason of some law. So that any inclination of rising from a law may be called a law, not essentially, but by participation, excuse me, by participation, as it were. And thus, the inclination of the members to the concupiscence is called the law of the members. Just as an external action, we may consider the work and the work done. For instance, the work of building and the house built. So in the acts of reason, we may consider the act itself of reason, i.e. to understand and to reason and something produced by this act. 
with the regard to the speculative reason, this is first of all the definition. Secondly, the proposition. Thirdly, the syllogism or argument. And since all the practical reason makes use of a syllogism in respect to the work to be done, as stated above, and as the philosopher teaches, hence we find in the practical reason something that holds the same position in regard to operations as in speculative intellect. The proposition holds in regard to conclusions, such like universal propositions of the practical intellect that are directed to actions have the nature of law, and these propositions are sometimes under our actual consideration, while well, sometimes they are retained in the reason by means of a habit. In reply, object three, reason has its power of moving from the will as stated above. For it is due to the fact that one wills the end that the reason issues its commands as regards things ordained to the end, but in order that the volition of what is commanded may have the nature of law. It needs to be in accord with some rules of reason, and in this sense it is to be understood that saying that the will of the sovereign has the force of law, otherwise the sovereign's will would savor of lawlessness rather than of law. And then someone had written below here, they were in cursive. Sovereign will grounded in something, reason, reason of God, price to vice or God that was written in someone's hand. Second article, whether the law is always directed to the common good. We proceed thus to the second article, objection one. It would seem that the law is not always directed to the common good as, it's, as to its end. For it belongs to law to, com to command and to forbid, but commands are directed to certain individual goods. Therefore, the end of the law is not always the common good. Further, the law directs man in his actions, but human actions are concerned with particular matters. Therefore, the law is directed to some particular good. Further, Isidore says, the law is based on reason. Whatever is based on reason will be a law. A reason is the foundation not only of what is ordained to the common good, but also of that which is directed to private good. Therefore, the law is not only directed to the good of all, but also to the private good of an individual. On the contrary, Isidore says that laws are enacted for no private profit, but for the common benefit of the citizens. Okay. They're saying that laws should be enacted for profit, for for the good, for, but sometimes I don't think it is, but we'll get to that. that. We just read Plato, and I guess that kind of depends on the kind of government you have. I mean, you know, if you depending on the gov type of person that's running the government. I answered that as stated above. The law belongs to that which is a principle of human acts because it is their rule and measure. Now, as reason is a principle of human acts, so in reason itself there is something which is the principle in respect of all the rest. Wherefore, to this principle chiefly, and mainly law must needs to be referred. Now, the first principle in practical matters, which are the object of the practical reason, is the last end. And the last end of human life is bliss or happiness, as stated above. Consequently, the law must need needs regard principally the relationship to happiness. Moreover, since every part is ordained to the whole is imperfect and perfect, and since one man is as part of the perfect community, the law must needs need regard properly for the relationship to universal happiness. Wherefore, the philosopher in the above definition of legal matters mentions both happiness and the body, body politic, for he says that it, we call the, these uh, those legal matters just, which are adapted to produce and preserve happiness and its part for the body politic. Since the state is a perfect community, as he says in politics, now in every gen genus, that thing which reaches the highest degree is the principal cause of the rest in that genus. These others are braided with respect to it. So fire, which possesses heat, is the highest degree, is the cause of heat in mixed bodies. And these are said to be hot insofar as they have a share of fire. 
Consequently, since the law is cheaply ordained to the common good, any other precept in regard to some individual work must needs be devoid of the nature of a law, save in so far as regards the common good. Therefore, every law is ordained to the common good. A command denotes an application of law to matters regulated by the law. Now, the order to the common good at which the law aims is applicable to particular ends. And in this way, commands are given even concerning particular matters. Actions are indeed concerned with particular matters. But those particular matters are referable to the common good, not as to a common genus or species, but as to a common final cause, according to, as the common good is said to be the common end. Just as nothing stands firm with regard to the speculative reason, except that which is traced back to the first indemonstrable principles, so nothing stands firm with regard to the practical reason, unless it to be directed to the last end, which is the good, common good, and whatever stands to reason in this sense has the nature of a law. Third article, whether the reason of any man is competent to make laws. We proceed thus to the third article, objection one. It would seem that the reason of any man is, is competent to make laws, for the apostle says that when the Gentiles, who have not the law, to any nature, those things that are of the law, they are a law to themselves. Now he says this of all in general. Therefore, anyone can make a law for himself. Further, as a philosopher says, the intention of the lawgiver is to lead men to virtue. But every man can lead not another to virtue. Therefore, the reason of any man is competent to make laws. Uh, I guess that depends. I've never read St. Thomas, so we'll... We're learning together. <laughs> Further, just as the sovereign of a state governs the state, I'm sure. so every father of a family governs his household, but the sovereign of a state can make laws for, for the state. Therefore, every father of a family can make laws for his household. On the contrary, Isidore says, a law is an, or, is an ordinance of the people whereby something is sanctioned by the elders together with the commonality and, and it is true sometimes there are laws created that are foolish but I think we got into a lot of that in, in the uh, in the Republic <clears throat> I answer that a law properly speaking regards first and foremost the order to the common good now to order anything to the common good belongs either to the whole people or to someone who is the vice vestrant of the whole people and therefore, the making of a, of a law belongs either to the whole people or to a public personage who has care of the whole people, since in all of them matters the direct of en directing of anything to the common, to the end concerns him to whom the end belongs. Reply, a object one as stated above. Okay, we'll just push past those. A law is in a person, not only as in one that rules, but also by participation, as in one that is ruled. In the latter way, which one is a law to himself, in so far as he shares the direction that he receives from one who rules him. Hence the same text goes on, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. A private person cannot lead another to virtue if efficaciously, for he can only advise, and if his advice be not taken, has no coercive power, such as the law should have in order to prove an efficacious inducement to virtue, as a philosopher says. But this coercive power is vested in the whole people or in some public mess personage to whom it belongs to inflict penalties as we shall state further. Uh, wherefore, the framing of laws belongs to him alone, as one man is a part of the household so a household is a part of the state, and the state is a perfect community according to politics. And therefore, as the good of one man is not the last end, but is ordained to the common good, so to the good of one household is ordained to the good of a single state, which is a perfect commonality community. Consequently, he that governs a family can indeed make certain commands or ordinances, but not such as to have properly the force of law. <laughs> She's down there looking. Fourth article, whether promulgation is essential to a law. 
We proceed thus to the fourth article. Object. Objection 1. It would seem that promulgation is not essential to a law, for the natural law above all has the character of law, but the natural law needs no promulgation. Therefore, it is not essential to a law that it be promulgated. Further, it belongs properly to a law to bind one to do or not to do something. But the obligation of fulfilling a law touches not only those in whose presence it is to be pr it is promulgated, but also others. Therefore, promulgation is not essential to a law. Further, the binding force of a law extends even to the future, since laws are binding in matters of the future, as the jurists say, for promulgation concerns those who are present. Therefore, it is not essential to a law. On the contrary, it is laid down to the decretals, decretals that laws are established when they are promulgated. I answer that, as stated above, a law is imposed on others by a way of a rule and a measure. Now, a rule or measure is imposed by, a, by being applied to those who are to be ruled and measured by it. Wherefore, in order that a law obtain the binding force which is proper to a law, it must needs to be applied to the men who have to be ruled by it. Such application is made by it's being noti uh, notified to them by promulgation. Wherefore, promulgation is necessary for the law to obtain its force. Thus, from the law, from the four preceding articles, the definition of law may be gathered, and it is nothing else than an ordinance of reason for the common good, made by him who has care of the community and promulgated. The natural law is promulgated by the very fact that God instilled it into man's mind so as to be known by him naturally. I know. Those who are not present when a law is promulgated are bound to observe the law insofar as it is notified <laughs> or can be notified to them by others after it has been promulgated. You're funny. The promulgation that takes place now extends to future time by reason of the durability of written characters, by which means it is continually promulgated. Hence, Isidore says that lax law is derived from Laguerre to read because it is written. Question 91. I don't know if we'll get through that one, but we're at question 91. Of the various kinds of laws. And I will do my best to summarize the uh, this book. <laughs> we must now consider the various kinds of law under which head there are six points of inquiry. Whether there's an eternal law, whether there's a natural law, whether there's a human law. Well, there's definitely an eternal law. And there's definitely a natural law. And then humans make up their own government. So I think that's how that boils down. Whether there's a divine law. And there is a divine law whether there's one divine law or several, whether there's a law of sin, he is, and he really dig deep into it. First article, whether there's an eternal law. We proceed thus to the first article. Objection one. It would seem that there is an etern no eternal law, because every law is imposed on someone, but there was not someone from eternity on whom a law could be imposed, since God alone was from eternity, and then God himself is everything, he's the universe. Therefore, no law is eternal. But he can, he makes everything. He can change things. Further, promulgation is essential to law, but promulgation could not be from eternity, because there was no one to whom it could be promulgated from eternity. Therefore, no law can be eternal. That being said, I think the one eternal, they're saying that no law can be eternal, but anything that hurts hurts anything is definitely a law that's eternal. But he, he is the one that makes us all, so if he decides to, I don't know, like to say, be alone again, and then there's no, that law doesn't exist either because it would be only, it would be only the eternal, and come the father, mother, whatever. Further, a law implies order to an end, but nothing ordained to an end is eternal. 
for the lust and the loan is eternal, therefore no law is eternal. On the contrary, Augustine says that law, which is the supreme reason, cannot be understood to be otherwise than unchangeable and eternal. And we'll read St. Augustine too. I have some of his works. I answer that, as stated above, a law is nothing else but a, dic but a dictate of practical reason emanating from the ruler who governs a perfect community. Now it is <clears throat> evident, granted that the world is ruled by divine providence, as was stated in the first part, that the whole community of the universe is governed by divine reason. Wherefore, the very idea of the government of things in God, the ruler of the universe, has the nature of a law. And since the divine reason's conception of things is not subject to time, but is eternal, according to Proverbs, therefore it is said that this kind of law must be called eternal. Those things that are not in themselves exist with God, inasmuch as they are foreknown and preordained by him, according to Romans, who calls those things that are not as though those that are, according to the the eternal concept of the divine law bears the character of an eternal law insofar as it is ordained by God to the government of things for known by him. A promulg promulgation is made by word of mouth or in writing, and in both ways the eternal law is promulgated because both the divine word and the writing of the book of life are eternal. But the promulgation cannot be from eternity on the part of the creature that, ba that hears or reads. The law implies order to the end actively in so far as it directs certainly certain things to the end, but not passively. That is to say the law itself is not ordained to the end except accidentally in a governor whose end is extrinsic to him and to which end his, mu his law must need be ordained. But in the end of the divine government is God himself and his law is not distinct from himself, wherefore the eternal law is not ordained to another end. Second article, whether there is in us a natural law. We proceed thus to the second article, objection one. It would seem that there is no natural law in us because man is governed sufficiently by the eternal law. For Augustine says that the eternal law is that <coughs> by which it is right that all things should be most Orderly, but nature does not abound in, super, in superfluities, as neither does she fail in the necessaries, therefore no law is natural to man. Further, by the law man is directed, and his acts to this end is stated above. But the directing of human acts to their end is not a function of nature, as is, as is the case in irrational creatures, which act for an end solely by their natural appetite, where, whereas man acts for an end by his reason and will, therefore no law is natural to him, to man. Further, the more a man is free, the less is he under the law, but man is freer than all the animals on account of his free will, with which he is endowed above all other animals. Well, just ask Lil here. I love having her here, but she has to stay inside. But that's for her own safety, so she doesn't get hurt. Since, therefore, other animals are not subject to a natural law, neither is man subject to a natural law. On the contrary, a gloss on Romans, when the Gentiles who have not the law do by nature those things that are the law, comments as follows, although they have no written law, yet they have the natural law, whereby such each one knows and is conscious of what is good and what is evil. I answer that, as stated above, law being a rule and measure, can be in a measure in two ways. In one way, as in him that rules and measures, in another way, as in that which is ruled and measured, since a thing is ruled and measured in so far as it takes the rule of measure. Wherefore, since all the things subject to divine providence are ruled and measured by the eternal law, as was stated above, it is evident that all these things partake somewhat of the eternal law in so far as namely from it being imprinted on them, they derive their respective inclinations to their proper acts and ends. Now among all others, the rational creature is subject to divine providence in the most excellent way. 
insofar as it partakes of a share of providence by being provident both for itself and for others. Wherefore it is a share of the eternal reason, whereby it has a natural inclination to its proper act and end. And this participation of the eternal law in the rational creature is called the natural law. Hence, the psalmist, after saying, offer of the sacrifice of justice, as though someone asked what the works of justice are, adds, Many say, Who showeth us good things? In answer to which question, he says, The light of thy countenance, O Lord, is signed upon us, thus implying that the light of natural reason, whereby we discern what is good and what is evil, which is the function of the natural law, is nothing else than an imprint on us of the divine light. It is therefore evident that the natural law is nothing else than the rational creature's participation of the eternal law. This argument would hold if the natural law were something different from the eternal law, whereas it is nothing but a participation therefore is stated above. Every act of reason and will in us is based on that which is according to nature as stated above. For every act of reasoning is based on principles that are known naturally, and every, and every act of appetite in respect of the means is derived from the natural appetite in respect of the last end. Accordingly, the first direction of our, our acts to their end must needs be in virtue of the natural law. Even irrational animals partake in their own way of eternal reason, just as the rational creature does. But because the rational creature partakes thereof in an intellectual and rational manner, Therefore, the participation of the eternal law in the rational creature is properly called a law. Since a law is something pertaining to reason the state above, the rational creatures, however, do not partake, therefore, in a rational manner. Wherefore, there is no participation of the eternal law in them except by way of similitude. Now, I'm going to stop right there, and we will go on to, in our next video, third article and it's in the, of the various kinds of laws. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, and also stay tuned for the next installment of my reading of the political ideas of St. Thomas Aquinas.